All right. Welcome to Slugs and Steins Lectures from UC Santa Cruz. My name is April Yi, and I'm with the UCSC Alumni Council and one of your volunteer organizers tonight. And with me is David Hansen, a previous member of the UCSC Alumni Council and current volunteer organizer, along with Shana Kent with the Alumni Relations Office. And like last month, the organizers will stay on screen during the talk so that our speaker doesn't feel like he's alone in the room. And for those who are new, our Slugs and Steins series engages a UC Santa Cruz faculty member in discussion with you, our community, whether locally in the Monterey Bay and Silicon Valley or our extended community online, with a goal of making us all Renaissance people. And we want it to feel just like you're at UC Santa Cruz sitting in class, but with a drink in your hand and without tests. And before we get started, and since we can't see you, we'd like to know where you're zooming in from and how many people are watching. So please take a moment to fill out a short poll that will pop up on your screen and we'll share the results after we've given everyone a moment to respond. Okay. And you should be able to see the results of the poll <clears throat> and who is in the virtual room with you. So most people are here zooming in on their own, 78%. Um, a couple, a few people are watching as pairs. Oh, there's one person that's more than three of us, which is really cool. And um, looks like most people are <clears throat> from Santa Cruz County and the Bay Area. <laughs> One person said outer space. Um, that's always fun to hear. Thank you so much for participating in that. Um, so tonight we'll be tipping our steins with uh, Eric Porter, professor of history, history of consciousness and critical race and ethnic studies at UC Santa Cruz, where he is also affiliated with the music and Latin American and Latina Latino studies departments. He formerly taught in UCSC's American studies department, as well as at the University of Nevada and the University of New Mexico. His research and teaching interests include Black cultural and intellectual history, US cultural and urban history, and jazz and improvisation studies. His previous books include What is This Thing Called Jazz? African American Musicians as Artists, Critics, and Activists, which is a winner of an American Book Award, and New Orleans Suite Music and Culture in Transition, a collaboration with the photographer and UCSC Professor Emeritus of Art, Lewis Watts. And this evening, Professor Porter will discuss San Francisco International Airport, SFO, as a site whose history re reveals important perspectives on a wide range of phenomena that have helped to make the Bay Area. Along the way, he will read excerpts from his recent book, A People's History of SFO, The Making of the Bay Area and an Airport. And we will have a detailed Q&A at the end but you don't have to wait until the last minute to put your question in the Q&A box. You can type your questions into the Q&A box at any time. And if you see someone else's question that you like, you can upvote it and we'll ask it sooner during the Q&A time. Okay, does everyone have their <laughs> signs? Great, I've got your slug, Professor Eric Porter. Good evening, everyone. Um, and thank you, April, for that introduction. And thanks also to the Slugs and Steins team, David, Shana, and Diana, for organizing this event. Um, and thanks also to the audience for being here, um, joining, joining us this evening. So let me um, pause briefly and share my screen. Okay, so what can we learn from the airport? I'm gonna to try to answer that question this evening, mostly in some regionally specific ways, by drawing from my recent book, A People's History of SFO, The Making of the Bay Area and an Airport. The book is, as the title suggests, a history of San Francisco International Airport 
and the place where it is situated. So part of this book's project is to illuminate SFO's changing role as a catalyst for the development of the Metropolitan Bay Area. But it also examines the airport, located in San Mateo County, about a dozen miles south of downtown San Francisco, as an infrastructural manifestation of a wide range of social, economic, political, and other phenomena that have shaped the region. So along the way, this book tries to come to terms with SFO's role as a symbolic point of regional reference through which people have tried to imagine and live their individual and collective urban visions. And following that, following all of that, a people's history of SFO is about how lots of different people have abided, resisted, and otherwise negotiated the powerful forces that shape their lives in complicated and interconnected ways. So using an airport as a lens for understanding the history of a region may seem a bit odd. Um, after all, we often experience airports as alienating, unremarkable sites where we spend stressful minutes rushing to make connections or long monotonous hours waiting for delayed flights. And there's certainly a good deal of commentary about airports as non-places, as the anthropologist Marc Auger described them, in which scholars, journalists, and others have emphasized the uniformity of terminal spaces across the planet and the sameness of airport experiences, often depicting them as products of the homogenizing circulation of architectural styles, cultural practices, and social behaviors, in a globalizing world. But it long seemed to me that airports also tell us something very interesting about the places where they are located. As transportation hubs, ports of entry, workplaces, and more recently, high-end shopping malls and museums, they're places where many differently situated people come together, and not only travelers. And the interactions and activities of these people the work they do at airports, the policies they enact there, the ways they try to represent their cities or regions through cuisine and public art, and even the protests that sometimes happen at airports are reflected, reflective of broader social, political, and cultural dynamics. Among other things, airports are places where we can witness some of the inequalities defining human societies but also where we can see people living out their aspirations as workers, business people, travelers, and migrants. So I saw some of this with my own family history, which is actually linked to SFO. My grandfather worked as a sky cap at SFO beginning in the 1940s, and my father did the same on weekends and during summers in high school and college. My grandfather's job was, was what bought, brought the African-American side of my family to the Bay Area as part of the second great migration. And carrying white people's luggage into and out of the terminal, terminal was servile, servile work at a moment when most airport and airline jobs were off limits to black people. But it was good paying work and my grandfather used it to secure some measure of geographic and social mobility for himself and his family. And beyond that, I can recall vividly some of the lessons about social dynamics offered by the scene of service work at airports, which can tell us something about the composition of the working poor, recent immigration patterns, and related phenomena in a given region. The white people working the fast food counters at Washington State SeaTac in the early 1990s brought home to me the declining fortunes of that working class in the area, as young professionals, they served in transit, drove up rents and home sale prices. A decade later, a white woman tossing trash at the feet of a veiled Somali custodial worker at Phoenix Sky Harbor illuminated the rising Islamophobia, the changing dimensions of anti-Blackness, and the challenges facing East African immigrants in that region after 9-11. Um, a decade after that, multi-hued members of a jet-setting elite expressing their disdain for Filipinx workers paid to enforce security screening protocols at SFO's international terminal spoke of complex transnational race and class divides, as well as attendant global patterns of servitude. 
As I would learn later, the fact that these security workers were significantly better paid than they had been 20 years earlier reflected a local history of Service Employees International Union organizing and an array of living wage campaigns and municipal ordinances in and around San Francisco. But the fact that their ranks no longer included green card holders spoke to the inability of local activists and politicians to change the new US citizenship requirement for airport security workers in the Aviation Transportation and Security Act or ATSA that was signed into law in the wake of the September 11 terrorist attacks. In other words, airports are interestingly situated in their environs. They are complexly networked infrastructures connected to faraway places through air travel and design, but also to the places where they are located by roadways and the commuting workers who travel on them, by the power grid, economic relations, labor contracts, municipal and state laws and regulations, the input impacts airports have on the natural environment and other phenomena. And as such, they can provide useful touchstones for thinking about some of the interconnected forces that have influenced the development of their regions over time. So a little over a decade ago, with such lessons in mind, it dawned on me that I might finally pursue a long deferred plan of writing some kind of history of the Bay Area by focusing on its largest airport. Doing so would allow me to explore relationships that differently positioned people have had with one another and to various forms of accumulated power that have shaped the region at different moments. And as I started reading some of the popular and scholarly writings about airports, you know, I found a, a lot of good commentary on some of the questions about network power and human connection that I was interested in, but not specifically as related to SFO. So it seemed to me then that there was a history that needed to be told, which I've tried to do through a series of stories in the book that tie aspects of SFO's histories to SFO's history to that of the broader Bay Area. So I'm gonna spend the rest of my time this evening um, addressing some of the specific lessons that SFO's history offers. And I'm gonna start at the beginning, that is with the land and the water on which the airport was built. Uh, but first we're going to do a little quiz. Um, so there actually are gonna be some tests this evening. Um, so in that sense, it very much will be like a class. Um, so the first question is, um, uh, what year did the, um, what year did the facility that eventually become SFO open? Was it 1909, 1927, 1940, or 1954? So we'll just wait a few more seconds for the results to come in. Okay, so the majority of you, just over 50%, got the correct answer, which is 1927. Um, and 1909 FYI is the date of the opening of the College Park, Maryland airport, which is generally considered to be the world's oldest continuously operating airport. Uh, 1940 is just a randomly chosen date, although it that year did see a lot of construction at SFO. Um, and then 1954 is when San Francisco Airport was officially designated San Francisco International Airport. So I will um, get back to that in a, um, in, a, in a little while. Okay, so SFO was originally established as Mills Field in 1927 upon a patch of reclaimed Bayside salt marsh in San Mateo County that was first leased and then sold to the city of San Francisco by the wealthy local Mills family. Um, and since then, of course, the airport has expanded dramatically to cover a much wider expanse of tidelands, dry land, and filled in San Francisco Bay. So SFO's own self-produced histories and um, some of the journalistic coverage of early airport activities 
Um, they often began with the land as it existed in 1927, and such accounts um, you know, tend to emphasize the planning and engineering accomplishments necessary for this infrastructure to rise out of the mud, so to speak. Um, and I also wanted to start with the land, but given my interest in how accumulations of settler colonial and imperial relationships have shaped the Bay Area, I decided to take the story back earlier. Um, and what I learned after doing that was just how complicated some of those relationships were, even in this one relatively small place. So in the book's first chapter, I talk about how this salt marsh, open water, and surrounding dry land were first transformed by the Ramatush Ohlone people who for millennia hunted, fished, foraged, and cultivated plants on and near the site. And then I go on to talk about how after the Ohlone were dispossessed, died in large numbers from European-born diseases, and were taken to the Spanish mission in San Francisco, the future airport land and water were transformed by other relationships developing upon it as the Bay Area moved from being part of the peripheries of Spain and Mexico to becoming a major population and economic center in an increasingly powerful United States with imperial ambitions. So the future airport site was transformed among other ways in the 18th and 19th centuries by the San Francisco Mission and Presidio grazing their cattle in the area and by the California rancher Jose Antonio Sanchez doing the same with his cattle after purchasing the land from the mission and by the Mills family patriarch, wealthy banker and gentleman farmer, Darius Ogden Mills, who after purchasing the land from the mission and establishing an estate there, hired Chinese workers to build a levee to reclaim part of the salt marsh so he could um, graze his dairy cows on it. Um, also transformed by runoff from Mills Finance Sierra Nevada gold mining operations, silting the bay floor and by oyster companies establishing their beds in the shallow waters off of the mills estate because they provided more protection. That area provided more protection from mining runoff than sites in the northern and eastern parts of the bay. And by Chinese fishermen running a shrimping operation above their oyster beds after being excluded from established fisheries elsewhere in the Bay Area. So let me read a little bit of, um, read from the end of chapter one, where I ultimately argue that the relationships among different people on that colonized land in the 18th and 19th centuries helped to establish some of the future facilities and the Bay Area's economic, social, and political foundations. In 1883, shortly after he moved to New York, Darius Ogden Mills gifted the state of California a statue of Christopher Columbus kneeling at the feet of Queen Isabella of Spain while receiving her commitment to finance his initial voyages to the Americas. The statue sat in our capital's rotunda until it was removed in the summer of 2020 in the wake of nationwide protests against police murders and structural racism. It was a fitting parting gift from Mills, given his role in extending the colonial processes initiated in the Americas by Columbus's voyage. As Mills's brother and banking partner Edgar put it at the dedication of the statue, California, more than any other state in the American Union, fulfills Columbus's visions of marvelous lands beyond the setting sun. Of the many peoples who up until 1883 had lived, worked, traveled on, or otherwise shaped the land that became the Mills estate, the Ramaytush Ohlone experienced Columbus's visions most directly and tragically. But their brutal encounter with Spanish colonizers was just the first of many entanglements that happened at that place. Soon, the more locally situated settler colonial processes of grazing, shrimping, oystering, and recreating that had defined this land shaped as they were by the imperialistic reach of Mills's and others transnational business practices would be superseded by others. But these processes were still local, but they reached farther and more consistently beyond the setting sun as they drew Bay Area residents and others into ever-growing and farther reaching assemblages. 
The relationships that define them were products of a denser integration of capital, governmental, military, and social networks that were eventually facilitated and imagined through a new kind of infrastructure, San Francisco's airport. So the next couple of book chapters show how the development and expansion of the airport from its opening in 1927 to its official, official designation as San Francisco International Airport in 1954 were indeed shaped by 20th century versions of these networks. And one major theme here is how the early growth of SFO as civilian infrastructure was tied to the militarism that played a, such a large role in the development of the Bay Area in the 20th century. The airport benefited from direct subsidies from the US military, as well as from other federal funding justified by the argument that civilian airports played important civil defense and military troop and transport and cargo transport functions. And of course, the air industry benefited more generally from aeronautical technologies developed for the military. I also show how local boosters and municipal officials often justified public funding for airport construction and expansion on the grounds that they would fuel a growing Bay Area economy via trade across the globe, especially around the Pacific Rim, and create jobs on the ground at and near the airport. But such benefits were not distributed evenly. So another fundamental lesson explored across these chapters is how SFO can be seen as both a barometer and an engine for the social inequalities that were part and parcel of the Bay Area's growth into a metropolitan region. So I'm gonna read a bit um, from the third chapter where I talk about such developments in the 1940s and 1950s. And this chapter focuses on a, an August 1954 festival when 500,000 people descended on SFO over three days to celebrate the dedication of its new terminal, seen in this picture, and official designation as an international airport. <clears throat> For some visitors, it was a chance to take their first look inside an aircraft. 43 military and civilian planes were on display. Others spent significant time among the throngs at the new terminal state-of-the-art cocktail lounge. The festival also afforded visitors the opportunity to invest in regional pride in various visions of internationalism presented to them by airport officials, airlines, local business and community groups, government officials, the military, and entertainers. There were clowns and acrobats, wandering folk artists, U.S. Air Force, Army, Coast Guard, and Marine bands, and beauty queens. Festival goers could watch airline-sponsored films promoting travel to Hawaii, Mexico, Japan, Tahiti, and U.S. destinations, participate in drawings for prizes brought from Europe by TWA, join the crowd hoping to catch one of the packets of imported Irish shamrocks dropped from a helicopter hovering overhead, or inspect a Pan Am Boeing 377 Stratocruiser, which the airline used for flights to Honolulu, Honolulu and Oceanic and Asian destinations beyond. And the Stratocruiser, which is the white aircraft in the background in this photo, was a civilian version of the Strato Freighter military transport plane which was itself an offshoot of the B-29 Super Fortress bomber used to, among other things, drop atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The festival, I'm still reading here from the chapter, um, the festival was also a performance of the gendered whiteness of the airport as workplace, travel hub, and economic engine, which made sense given the demographics of California and Bay Area power and wealth at this moment. Written descriptions and photographs of the weekend's festivities show uniformly white and male groups of elected, elected officials, including local mayors and California Governor Goodwin Knight, union leaders and airport officials presiding over the dedication and other events. Their wives were there too, but very much as wives offstage in their finery. The beauty queens on display also enhanced the whiteness and the heteronormativity of the festival. 
The festival crowd was remarkably white too. Again, this was not surprising given that the Bay Area population was still over 90% white in 1950, despite recent migrations of African-Americans, uh, Mexican-Americans, Native Americans, and others um, to the area to work in the defense industry. But photographs of the event show a crowd even wider than that. The site-specific demographic seems in part a product of the asymmetrical distribution of spending power among the region's inhabitants. Civil, civilian air travel in the United States was in 1954, despite its recent partial democratization, still largely the provenance of reasonably well-off white consumers. The largely monochromatic crowd was, like, was also likely a function of what um, sociologist Wilson Record called the basic racial provincialism, that is social and residential segregation, that underlay the Bay Area's surface cosmopolitanism during the post-war period. And this is Record writing in the late 1950s um, or right around 1960. Moreover, Given that the crowds likely included a high representation of people with an economic relationship to the airport, as well as their family members, the whiteness of the festival goers would have stemmed from the systematic racial discrimination in airport employment, in the um, in airport employment in the local building trades whose members worked on airport construction projects, and among local vendors and other businesses that provided services to the facility. It spoke as well to how massive post-war infrastructure projects in San Francisco and the Bay Area more generally, publicly funded by federal aid and low interest municipal bonds, primarily benefited white consumers and workers, even though current and future black and brown residents remained on the hook for paying with them with their tax dollars and through the lack of investments in projects that would have benefited them more directly. But I go on in this chapter to talk about how small numbers of people of color at the 1954 festival, like the black couple in this photograph, anticipated growing participation in airport related phenomena by a wider range of people. And that's essentially what I address in the following three chapters, three book chapters, which shift the focus away from infrastructural developments and social elites, although those remain part of the story, in order to address how members of increasingly visible and vocal Bay Area constituencies engaged with the, work, with the airport as workers, business people, neighbors, and travelers. And all three chapters take their cues from protests that either happened at the airport or happened you know, on the streets in San Francisco or in board of supervisors or city council meetings and elsewhere in response to airport related issues. So one of these chapters looks at African American labor and anti discrimination struggles at the airport. Another tells the story of anti jet noise activism in the communities that surround SFO. And both of those chapters start in the 1950s and take their stories into the 1980s. The third protest chapter addresses how people challenge US immigration policies, ranging from those banning LGBTQ travelers from entering the United States um, circa 1980 to President Trump's 2017 so called Muslim ban. And one lesson that comes out of these airport related struggles for dignity, rights, comfort, safety, and remuneration in the Bay Area is that they're often quite diverse in terms of the wide array of um, people and institutions that shape them. And another lesson following the logic of airport operations is that liberal and even progressive efforts to gain access and justice in a region known for its hospitality and cosmopolitanism sometimes reproduce inequalities in complicated ways. Um, so I'm going to read an excerpt from the chapter on Black anti-discrimination and labor activism at the airport. Um, and there I address how such struggles were really quite dynamic, reflecting the array of social positions of Black people who worked at or did business at SFO. Um, but as this story concludes in the 1980s, 
following airline deregulation, the weakening of organized labor, the scaling back of some affirmative action programs and other factors. The chapter also shows that despite some successes, these struggles had their limits. Um, and in that sense, they give insights into the broader story of black social and labor movements in the Bay Area. Um, airport struggles, airport focused struggles succeeded in securing black people some significant access to better paying work and business opportunities. But many black men and women um, at the airport as elsewhere were still consigned to low wage, low skilled work, intermittent employment and unemployment. Um, so, but before doing that reading, um, we're gonna do another quiz, which is uh, relevant to um, what I'll be talking about in a second. So um, quiz is, uh, question is, what year was the first African-American woman hired as a flight attendant by a US carrier? Was it 1954, 1957, 1964, or 1968? So again, I'll give you a few minutes or um, some seconds to, to answer that question. Okay, so the majority of you, close to 50% said 1968, um, slightly smaller numbers for 64 and fewer numbers than that for 57 to um, and 1954. Okay, well, the um, the correct answer is 1957. Um, Ruth Carol Taylor was hired in December of that year by Mohawk Airlines, which is a long defunct, um, I believe, um, East Coast carrier based in New York. And she worked her first flight the following February, so February 1958. And though she didn't work long as a flight attendant, she did go on to have a long career as a civil rights and women's rights activists. And the other dates I gave, 1954, 64, and 68, of course, are prominent dates in civil rights, Black political history. Um, so I kind of put them in there to throw you off a little bit, perhaps. Okay, so um, I'm going to uh, read an excerpt where I focus, um, from the book, where I focus on the efforts of Bla Bay Area Black women to secure jobs as flight attendants during the mid-1960s. And these efforts in the Bay Area followed close to a decade of activism by Black women like Taylor and their allies um, to secure such jobs on the East Coast and in the Midwest. Also followed recent federal government pressure on airlines um, to um, end discrimination in their industry and institute affirmative action programs because they did, after all, um, conduct some of their business under federal contract. And this also happens at a time of changing public opinion. Um, okay, so as civil rights activism and uprisings refocused attention on black job discrimination and poverty in urban areas, some major corporations wanted to appear sympathetic and helpful. They were often also worried that urban unrest would hurt their bottom line. Indeed, from 1964 forward, the major airlines made Black and other in-house minority advancement, as well as commitments to community service and civil rights, a growing component of the self-representation in advertisements, employee communications, and messaging to shareholders. Employing Black women as glamorous flight attendants was one component of the airline's growing efforts to incorporate Black people into their self-representation, and Black women and their allies in the Bay Area seized the opportunity. Flight attendants glamour, however, defined the limits of this activism. During this period, they had to adhere to strict age, height, and weight limits and could not be married. And Taylor, for example, was fired only six months into her job after getting married. The airlines also preferred to hire light-skinned Black women, and women with darker complexions received the brunt of racist hostility from coworkers and passengers alike. Black flight attendants may have diversified the labor force, but general conformity to Eurocentric and sexist standards of femininity 
continue to be reproduced and legitimized in the face of shifting liberal sensibilities. In other words, Black flight attendants who were essentially a temporary labor force by virtue of employment criteria based on age, appearance, and marital status operated as largely disposable feminized units of exchange in the economy of good deeds, visual accomplishments, and cost-benefit analyses that shape the implementation of corporate affirmative action policies under government mandate. Still, their efforts to secure work were a struggle at both the material and symbolic levels that advanced the cause of anti-discrimination in the industry and helped make it clear that a different kind of airport work was possible for Black people across class and gender lines. Okay, so then after those three protest-oriented chapters, I sort of finished up the book with two chapters focused on SFO's recent operations and programmings that address how some of the activities related to these things, um, these, uh, these, this programming, namely um, its public art and museum exhibits and its sustainability efforts, how, um, how these speak to ongoing social, political, and environmental phenomena that are shaping life in the Bay Area in the present and which promise to continue to do so in the future. Um, and SFO's efforts in these areas provide insights in part because, you know, these, their activities in these arenas have been very much shaped by the Bay Area's social and political climate, and also because in very self-conscious ways, SFO's, SFO officials have used them to brand the airport as a facility that is representative of and responsible to the local population. The arts and cultural programming, for example, have, have emphasized the work of Bay Area artists and featured collections from local cultural institutions, while the sustainability efforts can be seen as an attempt by SFO to position itself as a locally focused um, environmental steward while also responding to some of the activism that's happened um, around economic and social justice issues in the Bay Area. So I'll read from both chapters, um, first from the one on the airport museum and public art programs. Um, so just to offer a little bit more setup before I do that, um, and you all might be, so many of you might be familiar with, with these programs, but the, um, the public art program was established in 1977 under the auspices of the San Francisco Arts Commission and San Francisco Airport Commission. And the cultural exhibits began shortly after that in 1980 and have been curated by what has come to be known as SFO Museum. And these programs have been widely praised by travelers and art and museum professionals. Um, and in 1999, for example, SFO Museum became the first airport museum to be accredited by the American Alliance of Muse Museums. So I'm particularly interested in the complicated politics of these programs as they developed in general and as reflected in a few individual artworks and displays. And, and one thing I focus on is how artworks and exhibits have both critiqued and as positioned in the airport reflected re recent social transformations and unequal social dynamics in the region. So the section I'll read analyzes two permanent public artworks at SFO with which some of you might be familiar. Um, one is Su Chen Hung's installation, Welcome, which is a series of glass panels with the word welcome displayed in different languages that greets travelers in the customs and immigration area. And um, the other is Juana Alicia's and Emmanuel Montoya's Sanctuario Sanctuary, which is a mural in one of the international terminals departure gates whose culturally diverse cast of subjects connecting one, one another are meant to portray the uh, multiracial Bay Area as a place of sanctuary. Um, and some of you may be familiar with Alicia or at least her style. Um, 
because um, among other things, she uh, painted the mural that is in the Oaks mural room. So some of you may have seen that example of, of, of her work. Okay, so here goes the, um, the excerpt. Building on a history of Bay Area arts activism, Sanctuario Sanctuary and Welcome counter contem contemporary patterns of displacement and exclusion. They are, after all, situated in a port of entry for many of the immigrants that have made the region more diverse. SFO also brings together Bay Area residents from across the region. So these works critique the Bay Area's ongoing project of producing a multicultural array of subjects and incorporating them into and across the metropolitan region unequally. At a moment when many elite Bay Area residents are more likely to connect professionally and personally via SFO and virtually with those living in other global centers of finance and technology than to connect to the working class members of the region working class members of the region, these artworks insist instead on a continuing central and thriving presence of those populations in the face of some of the economic, political, and social forces that make them necessary to the region's operation, but still socially and symbolically marginal within it. Yet much as radical mission district art, a movement that Alicia was part of, makes a gentrified San Francisco aesthetically pleasing and helps to brand the city, even Santuario Sanctuary is incorporated rather seamlessly into a space in which a vision of economic progress, unfettered mobility, cosmopolitanism, and sophisticated consumerism dominates. The success of such aesthetic integration was likely facilitated by the airport art steering committee's insistence that the pieces potentially emotionally disruptive elements be toned down. And this attempt by the committee to soften the piece's radical edges, even if not fully successful, gestures more broadly to the ways that multicultural celebration has at times been a terrain upon which unequal material distribution and outright displacement have been smoothed over and enacted in the Bay Area and elsewhere during the 1980s, 1990s, and beyond. A reading of Sanctuario, like that of many other artworks at the airport, must also contend with the fact that it is one of the pieces of public art and cultural exhibitions that sit behind the security gates, thus largely limiting access since 9-11 to ticket-holding passengers who can afford international travel and certain airport workers whose attention is often directed elsewhere. Moreover, international travelers typically get to view Sanctuario only when waiting to leave the Bay Area. Upon arrival, they bypass the gate area as they depart their aircraft and move towards customs and immigration. Along the way, some may well find encouragement or solace in Hung's welcome panels, and this may be sustained through the process of entering or re-entering the United States, but as I you know, talked about elsewhere in the book, that process will be exclusionary and traumatic for others. So um, Alicia and Montoya also intended this piece to offer a vision of sanctuary for non-human creatures living in and migrating through the Bay Area. And this, of course, is represented in the carved wooden shorebirds that frame the mural and also uh, by the paintings of birds on the columns of this structure represented here. Um, so the piece thus offers a kind of critique, and this is something that Alicia has talked about, a critique of SFO's destructive effects on both human and um, natural environments. Um, and such effects are something I address in the book in different ways, but the front and center in the final chapter, um, where I discuss SFO's recent sustainability programs and its efforts more generally to address climate change. So SFO's sustainability programs include things like recycling, wetlands and habitat restoration to mitigate its incursion into the bay and boosting its reliance on um, and use of renewable energy sources. And you know, in some ways, these programs are impressive as they seek to ameliorate the environmental destructive aspects of its operations. Um, but these efforts 
of course, and as you can imagine, are often are also defined by um, by their limits. Although SFO was at last chance on the way to becoming carbon at last check rather are uh, was on the way to becoming carbon neutral in terms of its on the ground operations. Um, such programs do very little to diminish the much, much larger amount of greenhouse emissions produced by the aircraft that use the facility, um, you know, both while there and also while flying um, between airports. Um, and such, emiss such emissions, of course, are, are one factor in the sea level rise that before too long may threaten the facility's basic operations. Um, and this is something SFO is currently planning to address in the future by building a, um, a seawall to protect the facility. So uh, a look at SFO's sustainability programs then provide me an opportunity to contemplate the environmental effects of, you know, sort of a broader array of colonial imperial processes that, you know, produced SFO and the Bay Area more generally in their current forms. Um, and then discussing such issues, you know, allows the book to come full circle, so to speak, by, by returning to the land uh, upon which the airport was um, built. So here's a bit from the beginning of the chapter that summarizes um, some of the issues that I address there, some of the lessons I, I draw from the um, SFO sustainability programs. That SFO is now under threat from rising sea levels speaks to this longer history of planetary warming that, that ironically has put in harm's way many of the oceanfront imperial and colonial metropolises that facilitated the fossil fuel consumption, deforestation, and other processes behind it. Waterfront airports have played particular roles in their own potential demises by facilitating commercial aviation's relatively small but still significant and growing contributions to fossil fuel consumption across the 20th and into the 21st century. The fact that the effects of sea level rise promise to be even more pronounced at SFO because it is sinking as the fill upon which it was built compresses from the weight of its largely concrete and steel infrastructure speaks to the legacies of a specific set of relationships that transformed the site over the years. Climate change has been a story shaped most profoundly and for longer periods by wealthy nations and empires, their corporations, certain oil companies, and the hubris, greed, complacency, and denial of social elites of various stripes. But SFO's growth as a global hub is also representative of how decolonization, modernization, and growing levels of energy consumption in India, China, and other more recently industrialized countries have contributed to the acceleration of the climate crisis over the past several decades. Closer to home, SFO's growth has been facilitated by the partial democratization of air travel since the mid-20th century, mid century and the related function of the infrastructure as a site of consumption and labor for a growing number of Bay Area residents. In other words, commercial aviation, like other contributions to the growing climate crisis, is an outgrowth of a long history of dispossession, exploitation, and profound and irrevocable changes to the earth, as well as of collective efforts by a wider range of people to live life conveniently and comfortably. SFO sustainability programs generally, and the airport's efforts to address climate change in particular, make clear some of the planetary costs accrued as people and things have been swept into the relationships that have defined the region. With a foundational commitment to remain economically viable and operational, but influenced by environmentalist thinking and more recently questions of social justice, SFO sustainability efforts demonstrate the ways progressive politics has shaped the operations and rhetoric of local government and industry over the past half century or so. But what SFO claims is an attempt to develop a more equitable ecology of humans and things in and around the airport speaks just as loudly of the limitations of the state of sustainability programs and, as discussed in other chapters, of the shortcomings of previous modes of social inclusion and environmental stewardship at and near the airport. Thinking into the future envisioned by such sustainability efforts compels us to confront the persistence of exclusion, inequality, and environmental degradation in the region into a future that may, may well witness the reclamation of the former salt marsh, 
mud flats and open water by a larger San Francisco Bay. So um, these excerpts from the book, these different chapters, excerpts from the different book chapters are just a few examples of how these how stories of development, encounter, and power played out at or in relation to SFO. And I, you know, my goal was that through these and similar stories in the book, I was able to give people, you know, both a sense of the history of the airport as well as um, of some of the things that it helps to illuminate about the Bay Area. And getting back to the title of the talk, I hope it's clear that one looks at the histories of things like labor struggles at airports, their public art and festivals, and even the land upon which airports are built, one can gain, gain new perspectives on the various places where they are situated. Um, you know, not just in the Bay, not just the Bay Area, but other places in the, in the U.S. and elsewhere in the world. Um, airports help us understand the, a multiplicity of connections that build a region over time, and they help us understand some of the ways that power is manifest in these connections. Um, as highly charged and controversial, deeply symbolic points of regional reference, airports are, after all, archives. And they can be read alongside the interesting, provocative, and sometimes bizarre sources one finds in local history rooms and government um, records depositories and elsewhere that show airports ever-changing meetings and importance for people, you know, um, not just travelers, but those who aren't or hope not to be just passing through. So um, thank you all for giving me an opportunity to um, share this work, and I would be happy to take some questions. And let me stop. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, that was most interesting. We've, we've got a list of questions. Uh, again, just to remind you, uh, you can enter questions down in the Q&A, and uh, there's quite a few now, so if you put in your votes, those with the most votes will rise quickly to the top, and we'll ask those first. Alice asks, uh, so she wants to compare how SFO uh, relates to this area as opposed to other airports in other areas. So she notes how it reflects settler colonialism, race, uh, class inequality, uh, other activism, other forms of conflict. How does it differ from other airports in terms of the history? How would you uh, compare them? That's a good question. It's a complicated question. Um, I mean, some of these things that this Alice just identified, you know, would be found uh, through a study of another airport. Um, you know, there, for example, is a some really good work on LAX um, oh, that looks at the jet noise issue and the steps people have take, act, local activists have taken to combat it. Um, a, a book by uh, Marina Peterson, for example, does this, um, I think it's called Atmospheric Noise, um, though I'm not 100% sure about that. But, um, you know, and that's the place where, yeah, some of these dynamics of um, class and race play out in the struggle in terms of who is affected by jet noise, who gets heard when they complain about jet noise. So again, similarities um, with, in the, you know, with that issue and many of these other issues with other airport. Um, but, you know, I think one of the things that makes SFO, well, it's interesting because it tells us something specifically about the Bay Area, right? And um, I think that, you know, it's, location in a place that has a particular area of immigration and political activism causes the um, um, some of these stories to be inflected in particular ways. Um, you know, for example, there was activism around the restrictions against LGBTQ travelers entering the US, U.S. circa 1980. There were also restrictions on people with AIDS flying into the U.S. Um, 
that manifests a little later in protests against airlines at airports and in the streets of different cities. Um, but they were inflected in particular ways and you know, rose to a certain amount of prominence because of the vil- visibility of the LGBTQ community here in the Bay Area and the, um, you know, the particulars of the, um, um, you know, what people in that pol- politicized community were involved in at the time. Thank you for that. Um, Rao asks, did Oakland Airport also experience the same growing pains as SFO? Do you happen to know? Some of the same growing pains and some of these issues that I discuss in the book are also relevant with Oakland's airport. Um, in fact, I thought as a person from the East Bay, um, <laughs> and me um, someone who probably early in life flew out of Oakland more so than SFO, I thought, well, I really should be writing a book about Oakland, which is its own fascinating story. Um, and I do talk a little bit about Oakland in the book, but you know, it definitely, um, is secondary, um, tertiary to what I, um, I talk about S- uh, San Jose too, but they don't get as much um, attention as SFO. Um, yeah, interesting play ways we can compare them. Um, early in the airports, um, the history of aviation in the Bay Area, it wasn't clear that San Francisco was going to be the major airport. In fact, shortly after S- the San Francisco's airport, or so- shortly after Mills Field, um, opened the um a lot some of the airlines moved to or air carriers moved to Oakland because they thought it was safer and that the weather conditions were better and then it's you know for a short period it seemed like Oakland was going to be the region's airport but so it wasn't really until World War II when um so I, if I remember the story correctly the military completely took over Oakland's airport did you know partially took over San Francisco's airport, but also still allowed it to continue its commercial operations and then spent a huge amount of money expanding the facility, you know, for its own purposes, but with the understanding that it would, um, um, those expanded facilities could be used for civilian aviation after the war. Um, So it wasn't really until that happened where SFO really overtook Oakland and it was clear that that was gonna be the, um, absolutely clear it was going to be the major airport. But yeah, some of the struggles, some of the protests around labor, you know, whether or not non-citizen screeners were going to be able to continue to work at the airport um, following 9-11. You know, there were um, very significant protests um, on behalf of those workers um, at Oakland, as there were at San Jose as well. So, yeah, other lots of similarities, you know, a fair number of similarities, parallel stories, just often not on, on as big a scale. And I just don't know as much about them, ultimately, because I focus on SFO. So Gregory uh, wants you to go deeper into the, the questions caused by the low elevation and the rising sea levels. Uh, he notes particularly the impact on neighbors. Uh, maybe some of the interactions that may happen with neighbors if an FF only, FFO only seawall turns out not to be sufficient. Yeah, that's a big question and it's something I touch on in um, in the book. And it's there's a lot of press cover, journalistic coverage, and government reports about you know the the threat of and possible impacts of sea level rise. Um, you know, the, the effects on low-line Bay Area infrastructure, the airports, you know, not just FSFO, Oakland and San Jose as well, um, Nimitz Freeway, Bayshore Freeway, um, various tech campuses, low-line, low-income, and not so low-income um, um, communities as well. And yeah, I mean, the a big question is going to be to what extent can different municipalities um, facilities, um, counties, regional planning organizations coordinate their efforts to um, build infrastructure to um, protect different entities from sea, wa- sea um, level rise and to what extent will um, different entities go it alone. Um, and I know that um, 
SFO, you know, at least when I, as of when I had done the research um, for this book, was involved in some conversations with some of its neighbors, like, you know, the cities of Millbrae and Burlingame and um, Brisbane and South San Francisco about coordinating efforts. But I also know that there are people in those communities that are worried that SFO will go it alone, or to some extent alone, and build a seawall that protects it but that would just displace water into other um, other areas. And this is something that um, planners, environmentalists more generally are, are concerned about across the Bay Area. And again, I'm not a scientist, you know, I'm a historian, right? So I can only speak as someone at, the, <laughs> at a very basic level about this these things. But, you know, a lot of people who are scientists are looking very carefully at this um, and trying to influence policy around this because, you know, this is, could be a huge issue if, um, if you know, Various infrastructures are put into place to protect, again, cer certain entities from sea level sea uh, level rise, but these things aren't coordinated. Yeah, it could be catastrophic for other entities that aren't protected by those projects. Hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Chris asks, regarding SFO, I have heard the planes dump their fuel on nearby neighborhoods in moments of panic. Um, where is that reported, the FAA or elsewhere, if it's reported at all? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, I mean, I would imagine that, I mean, I would guess given that the approaches are typically over the bay, mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, this has its, you know, obviously that would be catastrophic in different ways. Um, that if a plane were in some, a plane landing, we're having, we're in distress. That would be the thing. That would be the plan to drop fuel over the water. Although I suppose if there was some emergency on takeoff, that could happen over one of the communities, because um, planes do take off to the northwest. Um, well, they take off different directions, but you know, immediately, one takeoff trajectory has planes, you know, immediately flying over South San Francisco and other um, surrounding communities. So I, I, again, I'm speculating here, but I suppose if that were, to, if something were to happen, there's some chance fuel could be dropped over those communities. Um, or the East Bay is for, by planes flying over the, you know, taking off over the Bay and then ascending over East Bay communities. Um, but I just, I'm not knowledgeable about this, you know, to what extent it's happened or what explicit policy would be. I would imagine if there is information out there, um, the FAA, the EPA, um, perhaps some regional environmental organizations, governmental organizations would have information about that. Um, but I don't know. If you want to email me, I could um, think about it more and uh, Go back through think yeah think about it a little more maybe go through some sources and see what might what what entity might be helpful. Super, thank you, Stephanie wants to first of all thank you for your illuminating work, uh, and she wonders if you could speak to how SFO's diversity sustainability programs relate to synergize with or differ from uh, those of other Bay Area airports. Um, I cannot answer that question. Um, just, I, um, I mean, I could start just because I didn't, I had not, I did not look at documentation related to San Jose or Oakland, um, or any of the, you know, smaller airports, um, with, you know, handfuls of employees that cater to private flyers. Um, in terms of the, sustainability efforts, both in terms of sustainability vis-a-vis -vis environmental issues and also sustainability in terms of thinking about a broader ecology of that includes human beings too. Um, and I don't have the names of them at hand, um, but SFO has been or was involved in collaborations, or I should put it, they were members, they were a member of sort of these broader organizations of airport operators that were talking about sustainability, interested in implementing sustainability um, programs. So, you know, my guess is that um, to some extent, 
the other Bay Area airports were drawing from some of the same documents that were, you know, reports and the like that were discussing, you know, how airports can be more sustainable, um, you know, drawing upon policies, initiatives created by these, you know, airport, airport operators um, organizations, but specifically how they compare, I just, you know, I, I, I can't, I can't answer the question. All right, thank you. Um, Van asks, and you mentioned this, I think briefly, um, were AIDS patients or LGBT prohibited from having a seat on the plane? I know you said they were prohibited from flying in general. Um, and then maybe, you know, when did that ease up or when did they become allowed to fly? Yeah, um, I'm gonna be a little fuzzy here because it's been a while since I've actually done the work for this, but there was a um, provision in US immigration law um, barring, um, you know, quote unquote homosexuals from immigrating to and even entering the US that was enforced um, at some moments very strictly at other moments less so intermittently, you know, really into the um, 1980s when there's, um, you know, across the 70s and 80s, there's a lot of activism around this. And, you know, I can't remember the specific year, but there is a moment when the you know, federal government uh, de-emphasizes that restriction and then it's ultimately eliminated, I believe, in the 1990s sometime. Um, but I'm going from memory here. And in terms of um, bans against um, people with AIDS or HIV traveling. There was part, there was a federal policy restricting people with AIDS, people who are HIV policy, people, people were, um, who are HIV positive from traveling to the U.S. Um, instituted in the um, late 1980s, I believe. Um, and that really blew up in, um, became this huge controversial issue around the time of the 1990 um, AIDS conference in San Francisco. So a lot of activism around that. And it was, um, I mean, a long complicated story. Um, you know, there was a, um, what, what would I call it? A, um, a, a waiver was approved to let people with AIDS travel to the US for certain reasons, but not for other reasons, you know, for official business, um, to go to the conference, for example, but not necessarily to visit, um, to seek medical attention or to um, visit a dying friend or lover. Um, and, you know, that eventually eased sometime after that. Um, but again, the specific date, I'd have to go back to the book because it's been a, 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 bit, a bit of time since I, um, did the research for this. Um, at the same time, you know, individual airlines had their own policies um, about um, both in terms of employing people with AIDS or who are HIV policy and allowing people um, with AIDS or who are HIV um, positive to travel. And, you know, many of the major carriers um, had um, proscriptions against that, although eventually those, and, um, you know, those were eventually um, eased um, following lawsuits and activism. But again, you know, I think in the um, mid, late 1980s. Hmm. Bit of an aside, but it, it is a, a personal memory. Uh, I took my wife into the American embassy in Oslo she's Norwegian, to get uh, for a visa application. And she, at that point, had to sign a document stating that she was not a communist, homosexual, or prostitute wow. in order to apply for, uh, for a visa. Right. Uh, it's good so that that's fine. Karen Act of the 1950s. Yeah. Peter asks, does your book address how San Francisco's local domestic partners ordinance that created a way to recognize committed relationships of same gender couples and provide benefits to them, resulted in United Airlines eventually providing domestic partners benefits to all its employees, regardless of where they worked. 
Um, I'm aware of that. I may have mentioned it very briefly, um, but I don't talk about it at length. Um, there's a great book called Plain Queer. Um, I think the author is Tiana Meyer, um, but I'm not 100%. I have to go to the bibliography of the book. Um, but um, which is about um, queer flight attendants, and um, it's addressed at length in that book. Yeah, T. Meyer, Philip T. Meyer, Plain Queer, Labor, Sexuality, and AIDS in the History of Male Flight Attendants. So I know that T. Meyer um, addresses the domestic partner ordinance at some length. All right, thank you. Um, Chris has a fun question. I think it was from the intro. Um, what is your favorite jazz club in New Orleans? <laughs> oh, boy. Um, I think it's gone now. <laughs> um, I mean, it's been it's been uh, it's been well over a decade um, uh, since I've been in New Orleans. But there was a place called Donna's that was right on um, sort of situated between um, the Treme and the French Quarter. That was a great club that I only had a chance to go to a few times, but it was it was a good club, great club. Lots of history there. So Van has another question. Uh, he, want, he wants to know about who, which groups were ever denied a seat, and maybe in particular at FCFO. I'm sorry, say that again. Say that again. Which which sectors of society, which groups in society were denied seats on a plane, such as happened on school segregation buses, Jim Crow, et cetera? Were there periods of time when certain groups were denied? seats on planes coming out of SFO? Coming out of SFO? Well, I think there's a kind of, um, yeah, I don't really look at in the book sort of segregation on flights because I'm really, I'm focused on sort of what's happened on the ground in and outside of the airport. Um, you know, from what I know about segregation vis-a-vis -vis African-Americans from some of the scholarship that's out there, um, you know, they're typically, although it was a, you know, a very segregated, I mean, the air industry had very segregated workforces, um, you know, in terms of passengers, it didn't have the same um, strictly enforced rules in part because not that many black people could afford to fly, um, you know, for much of the his early history of aviation. Um, and, you know, I think that the segregation tended to be um, enforced in terms of where Black passengers who were able to afford tickets were encouraged to sit on the planes. And if, um, if memory serves me right, there was a sense that the seats in the front of the plane were less, I mean, I could be wrong about this. This is just from memory from something I read. The seats in the front of the plane were less desirable. So ironically, you know, whereas African-Americans were forced to sit in the backs of segregated buses, they were encouraged to sit in the fronts of planes and save the more desirable seats for, um, for um, other pa white passengers primarily. Um, but there's a, um, I'm making refer people, I mean, because that's what we do sometimes when we're not quite sure how to answer a question. We refer people to scholars who we know can answer the question. Um, a great, fairly recent book by Mia Bay called Traveling Black about an array of um, African-American struggles against discrimination in transportation industries focused both on labor, but also on you know, access to different conveyances. And I know that um, the, her book has a, um, um, a discussion of, you know, efforts to make flights more accommodating for um, Black passengers. All right, thank you. Um, so this question just got upvoted from Joseph. He says, hey, Eric, thanks for a wonderful talk. As a music student at UCSC, I'm wondering if you talk about the sonic, particularly music in the airport, i.e. Muzak, 
you know, an ambient which helps create environments to alter behavior, elevate mood, et cetera. Do you talk about this in your new publication? I'm sure you can extend this out to genre as well. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I don't, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I mean, there's a sonic element to the project and you know, it's there I draw from some scholarship in sound studies, you know, obviously, which is related to music studies. Um, there's a chapter on, um, jet noise and jet noise activism, anti-jet noise activism that emanated from communities like Millbrae, South San Francisco, Burlingame, and other, other areas, and kind of the class, gender, racial politics around that. And, um, you know, I talk about how jet sounds as this, you know, very disruptive sonic force had different, me you know, definitely altered people's moods. And inspired them to act. <laughs> um, but, you know, also it held, held certain meanings for people. You know, for some people, even people negatively affected by the sounds, or at least who were exposed to loud sounds, um, you know, it still signified, um, you know, people who worked in the area and felt like they benefited ec economically from the institution. They're still willing to put up for this, with these sounds that they thought, you know, for them signified progress or access to the good suburban life that they're experiencing, you know, with this minor inconvenience of jet noise, whereas for other people, you know, it signified, they think these sounds signified all that was wrong with the world. Um, environmental de devastation, um, pollution, you know, uh, government overreach, you know, corporations having too much power to affect people's lives and so on. And that inspired their, their activism. I'm gonna slide in my own question if I could. You, you've talked about the African-American community, uh, Asian American community in this area is quite prominent. Uh, and I wondered if there was a different set of experiences, obviously different, but how how did it differ from the African-American treatment experience at SFO? Yeah, I mean, it's another good question. I mean, I think early on, um, the treatment of um, Asian American workers was not that dissimilar from that of African American workers. Um, Asian American workers early on, you know, say th into the 1960s, were like African Americans in terms of labor, um, consigned to, um, you know, service work at the airport, um, custodial work, working in kitchens, that kind of thing. Um, as far as I know, didn't have any, or at least just maybe just had a real minimal presence in the realm of sky capping, um, but in terms of other airport work had a very heavy, you know, with some exceptions, you know, had a pretty minimal presence. But um, so that's, so some of the um, affirmative action programs that, I mean, this is something I didn't talk about today, but I have a, discussion in the book about how the San Francisco Human Rights Commission began implementing a long series of affirmative action programs geared both to airport work and to um, contracts for construction and construction projects and vending services at the airport. Uh, so some of those aff affirmative action programs were also geared towards Asian American, um, Asian Americans, or at least those um, members of different Asian American subgroups that were underrepresented um, at the airport, at least up until a certain amount, a certain point in time. And then of course, I, I talked really briefly in the immigration chapter about going, you know, going back to one of the slides that I showed and, and what I talked about very early about security workers, I talked very briefly about the um, history of um, immigrant, Philippinex security workers, um, you know, how they came to occupy jobs at SFO, um, you know, work, um, you know, what were, you know, low level jobs. Um, basically, you know, these are jobs open to and often desirable to people who, um, you know, recent immigrants, um, um, people who just got status to work um, in, the, um, in, the, in, the, in the community. 
um, you know, these are often jobs that were accessible and they were passed down word of mouth within the community. And then I talk beyond that about how um, people first, um, security workers, Filipino security workers first were involved in the living wage campaign um, at the airport and more broadly in the area. And also um, then, you know, we're lobbying to try to, you know, people get jobs back for people who lost them because they were green card, hold, green card holders, not full citizens post 9-11. April, you get the last question. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is from Ames. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for your research and writing of this brilliant book. Any thoughts on how the possibility of electrical vertical takeoff and landing EVTOL aircraft, such as Santa Cruz based Joby, might influence airports or questions related to labor, race, the environment, and other issues analyzed in your book? Well, Ames, good question. It's not <laughs> something I've thought about. Um, you know, I think, I mean, I know that the, I mean, because of not only the impact of fossil fuel consumption on climate change, but the also, you know, the, uh, you know, peak oil and the fact that we're just going to use up all of the fossil fuels if we survive that long, um, to put it bluntly, um, you know, airlines are, um, you know, air ma aircraft manufacturers are looking at alternative fuels and alternative technologies. I just have no idea, you know, I mean, this company in Santa Cruz, I'm only vaguely familiar with, with and I think they're, these are very small aircraft, um, um, you know, that only can fly um, small numbers of people. So, you know, what is, you know, what are the implications for the air industry, you know, with its need to fly huge numbers of people? Mm. Yeah, that's, that's a big question. Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess, in terms of the question about race and class dynamics, I think we'd want to look at what the tech industry is doing in terms of class and race dynamics. And there have clearly been winners and losers in terms of um, how certain tech businesses treat their workers and what they expect from them and who is seen as legitimate for employment and who isn't. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I would hope that some of those inequalities that define um, parts of the tech sector would be addressed, but I can also see some of them being reproduced as well. But this is, you know, just this speculation on my part. Yeah, thank you for that. And for me, I, I have never heard of electric vertical takeoff and landing. So I, I would want to look at more into that myself personally to find out what's happening in, in that sector. Yes, April, you can fly down to Santa Cruz very quickly soon. <laughs> wow. Uh, well, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, this was fascinating. Please join me in applause for our Professor Pusher comments down in the q a you'll he'll get them later uh thank you for sharing your research this evening now uh the professor when asked which organization he would like uh you to contribute to and thanks for the talk he was pretty struck by the catastrophe in maui so look for uh look for a way to support that uh terrible terribly uh, impacted community there. I also want to thank the staff of Alumni Relations and our special events officers who marvelously organized this webinar and the whole series. We have Sheena, Diana, Paulina, and Kristen. Mike Reapy does fabulous work as one of the founders and co-organizers. And you'll see him again probably in September. So our next Slugs and Steins will again be on the second Monday, September 11th, will be titled Rediscovering Marco Polo. So we're going to stick with the history theme, but go back a few centuries. Sharon Kinoshita will guide us through the world explored uh, and associated with the exoticism, adventure, and east-west travel of this most famous medieval traveler. The talk will highlight some of the most curious aspects of that world that Polo observed. Sharon is professor of literature at UCSC, specializing in medieval French literature. 
Mediterranean Studies and Global Middle Ages. Her recent work on Marco Polo includes an annotated translation of the earliest surviving version of his description of the world, numerous essays on various aspects of his world, such as the silk trade, multilingualism, and animals. He also has a, she also has a book forthcoming in Reaction Press new series, Medieval Lives. I want you to, in particular note, we promised uh, no exams, but we do assign homework. She has a blog post called On the Road with Marco Polo, and it's in the Humanities Institute's 2022-23 series on travel. In addition to being a homework, it's an interesting series to you to catch up on areas. You'll find that and you'll find it down in the uh, Q&A or, excuse me, the chat section at, or you can look it up at THI for the Humanities Institute dot UCSC dot edu forward slash travel. Okay, meanwhile, UCSC has other exciting events awaiting this weekend. Please note that there's a new exciting program called Return to the Redwoods which will welcome alumni, friends, and family back to UCSC for a weekend of celebration, exploration, and an opportunity to relive the beauty of our campus. You can reserve your apartment or residence hall room and join alumni in the Redwoods for a weekend of reminiscing and making new memories. Again, this is August 18th to 20th. In addition, there are other events. Um, they include three being organized by the UCSC Farm a Tour, a talk on soil as teacher, preparing the ground for agroecology, and finally one on growing avocados on the Central Coast. You can find information on these events and others at calendar.ucse.edu. So on behalf of the UC Santa Cruz Alumni Association, thank you for joining us and please come back on September 11th at 6.30 p.m. for our next virtual event. Thank you again. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Good night.